keep us flowing. Uh, we have Lois Engel who's going to do section two on confirmation in the fall. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm kind of wedged in between Greg and, and Mike here. Uh, sorry, Seth and uh, Mike. Anyway, um, the managing the confirmation in the fall. This is pretty much the point where the foal arrives and you look at it and the first thing everybody goes is, oh my God, it's not perfect, okay? There's a lot of things that can happen as soon as they come out. Most of them will resolve, but again, I find that I take those first pictures, the first 24 hours, I send them to the client, they take one look at the foal and they're already freaking out because it's not perfectly straight and how come it's uh, down in uh, the ankles and you know walking along, they're not straight or they're too upright or their hind legs are windswept or they're over in the knee. There's, there's so many different things. And what you need to remember is this horse has spent, oh, 11 months or so inside a very small area in this mare and has to come out and just like uh, human babies, they don't look perfect usually when they come out. So anyway, I just want to go over the uh, congenital confirmation problems. So, you know, you're going to see a lot of um, technical terms, uh, flexor flaccidity, contracted tendons, um, and flexural deformity, incomplete ossification of both the torso, <coughs> which is the hock, or carpal, which are the knee bones, um, and congenital angular deformities. Okay, just to give you a quick overview, um, the congenital conformation problems, those are issues the foals are born with. Um, they can be a result of underdeveloped bones, maybe the, the foal is premature, um, maybe not, it just may be a, a genetic issue. Um, tendons, ligaments, like I say, you will sometimes get them uh, where they're almost walking on their ankles. And then you can get them that they're up on their toes and they're so upright. And each of those can be treated differently, um, but you have to be very careful because if you get a foal that's very upright in the front and down in the back, oops, I think I hit the button that we said not to. Uh -oh. uh, there we go. <laughs> Um, then you're, you're working with contradictory issues, and that in particular is one that you have to make sure you have your vet there. You don't want to overcompensate and create more problems. You may fix one and make another one worse. Okay, so you'll probably hear me and both Seth and Mike say, check with your farrier, check with your vet. Um, we're not trying to run up your bills, but you need that expertise to look at the whole picture. And they've probably seen it a lot more or have dealt with some of these issues um, on a consistent basis. And they can tell you, in this case, this is our best course of action, okay? Um, again, the causes include genetics, intrauterine malposition, dysmaturity, prematurity, placentitis, septus in the foal, and poor nutrition in the pregnant mare. Um, we have seen septus in foals that go into joints. I just had a conversation. Uh, we had a foal this year um, by a very nice mare, came out, windswept in the back, very lax in the front, um, had to actually help her nurse for the first few days, seemed to be doing better, was kept in um, to limit her exercise, and then about a week later, couldn't get up. All of a sudden, in the morning, was having trouble. And we're looking at her, and it's like, they're too young for a hoof abscess, what's going on? Well, off she goes to the clinic. Turns out she had a septic hip, um, which I was just speaking with, with Vivian. She had one this year, too. But my understanding from the vet is the hip is a very unusual spot uh, for it to land. And what happens with septus is it's an infection in the blood system that will tend to land somewhere in the body. All right, so again, it could already be in the uh, foal system at birth. It could be acquired uh, in the first few days of life, but something that needs to be uh, 
watched. If that, that happens, that's an immediate off to the vet. They need um, IV antibiotics, they need flushing of the joint, things like that. You know, everybody says, oh my God, that's horrible. Well, a week later, this fall is fine, okay? Um, and now our bigger concern was the front legs. Um, it just actually had a, a screw put in um, for its knee because there were some issues there. A lot of these things you just have to be on top of. And for those in the audience that are not the hands-on people, but have horses and you board them somewhere, please stay in touch with your farm and the vet that works with the farm. Um, all too often, you know, an owner doesn't quite grasp what's being told. Um, I had an owner a few years ago, we kept telling her, your horse needs surgery. Yeah, well, you know, just do some trimming and be conservative. I don't want to, you know, spend the money for the surgery if I don't have to. This went on and on, like, you need to do the surgery now. You need to do it now. Um, waited too long, and the horse just was never right for racing. So don't be penny wise and pound foolish. Um, you know, if somebody's telling you you need to have this horse taken care of at a young age, when they're young, you have a very good chance of having a good outcome. The longer you wait, you're, you're risking not being able to do the correction that you need to do. Okay, so again, the first thing it says, these need to be recognized immediately at birth and treated quickly, okay? Again, we're not trying to spend your money. Um, we try conservative treatments first, but again, there are time frames. Um, as Seth mentioned, you've got growth plates that close at certain periods of time. You don't want to push up against that because you're, you're going to have issues then. Okay, flexor flaccidity. Um, again, commonly known as down in the pasterns, or as I said, they're almost walking on their ankles. And if you look at this picture here, if you saw that as your picture coming from uh, your farm of your newborn foal, everybody kind of goes, oh my God, what are we going to do? All right. If I tell you how many times I speak to owners after I send the pictures and say, don't worry about it. It should resolve in a, a couple of weeks. Understand, that's not a death sentence. That doesn't mean they're not going to run or they're going to have any major problems for the future. It's something that needs to be watched, possibly, you know, treated, uh, corrective farrier work, but it's something that can be dealt with. Um, again, if it's mild, you control the exercise and just watch. Okay, um, as Seth was saying, you may need to rasp. We do have uh, a farrier that comes in, he does a lot of corrective work. Um, he's been around for years and he will come in, he will do extensions he, with the Equilox if need be. Um, he's done all kinds of special shoes for them. We had a, a foal last year um, that actually had a septic P3 um, bone that needed to be flushed in surgery and the uh, hoof cut away, special shoes. If you saw this horse now, you'd never know it, okay? Again, it's intervention, it's doing what needs to be done in a timely manner and making sure you have the correct expert in that area, whether it be a farrier or a vet um, working with you. And again, here you can see where there's an extension done. Again, there's tons of corrective farrier work that can be done that will help these horses so that you won't see this uh, a month to six weeks down the road. Okay. On the opposite end of the spectrum, uh, contracted tendons or flexural deformities. If you see down here, whoop, this poor foal is basically looking like a ballerina on its toes. Um, again, looks awful, but if you address it correctly and quickly, um, that can be taken care of. 
So again, the treatment, if it's mild and it can stand, you're gonna limit the exercise, um, make sure that the foal isn't getting overtired standing, and you can see that when their legs start to quiver. Um, you know, do some trimming to make sure the sole is flat and, and some physical therapy. Um, if it's more severe, um, the vets will do uh, some bandaging, but again, that's something that you want to have somebody that has some expertise in doing, because again, Seth mentioned it, if you bandage or you do splints, you can end up creating sores, you can make it too tight, you can have um, issues that you're then dealing with, uh, with tendons, ligaments, things like that. So again, if, you're gonna, if that is what the recommendation is, make sure that that's something that the vet's doing, and if the bandage change needs to be done, that either the staff that's doing it or yourself has been given strict instructions how to do it, or if the vet's gonna come back to do it and check the progress from that point. Um, one of the big things that they will do is uh, a shot of Oxytet, or the tetracycline, to relax so that they come down. Also, as the fold puts on weight, that's gonna naturally push um, the, the joints down, all right? Um, again, one of the things you have to be careful about, and we had a horse like this, oh, second year that we had the farm, it was, uh, had contracted tendons in the front and was so windswept in the back and down uh, in the ankle in the back that it couldn't stand. We had to help it and hold it up for probably six weeks. Um, it was a foal, at one point we were second guessing if we should have saved. It had been a red bag, got it out, gave it oxygen, um, very weak, but it had a will to live. And every hour for the first few weeks, the staff was out there holding it up so it could nurse, gave it some bottle feedings in between. Um, even at four to six months, he was not great looking, had to have some surgery with some screws in the front. We had to be careful with the OxyTet because we didn't want to have more problems in the back end, which was, um, has had one problem in the front end that had the other. It really went on for about six months, and the, the horse's nickname in the barn was Boxer, because at one point, he would almost sit back on his back legs, but he'd hit with his front. And it got to the point where we would push him around, push him around. Well, the good news to this whole story was this horse that we weren't sure we should have saved ended up running and winning three times. Um, a horse by the name of Flashy Boo. So you never know. Um, you, you really just have to watch them, stay on top of them. And again, the first couple of weeks, don't panic when you get the pictures from the farm if they don't look perfect. They're gonna toe out, hopefully, because that's what you want, because as the chest widens, it will bring the legs in. Um, again, you're going to see some that are weak, some that are um, a little contracted, but all of that will, you know, with appropriate attention, um, be taken care of. Again, as a last resort surgery, but give the foal time to see if the normal corrective treatments will work. If there's still an issue, you do have time on the growth plates. Um, to do some surgical intervention if needed. But again, start with the conservative and go from there. Um, incomplete ossification of the, uh, the tarsal uh, or carpal bones. I was just talking to somebody when I, I came in today and, and she was telling me that her foals for four weeks at Cornell um, waiting for the, the bones to uh, come around. And I think you said one's 100 and one's 85 at this point. So again, intervention, uh, recognizing the situation. Um, if they're not completely ossified, um, you know, it could be because of a premature or dismature foal. Um, you know, you really need to get that to a vet. You, you wanna make sure that the foal does not get turned out. They're gonna do more damage 
uh, by crushing the bones that are still uh, not formed. And you want to work with your veterinarian. Make sure that there's sequential uh, radiographs so that you can see the progression um, and the degree of the ossification. You want very limited, if any, turnout. It should be stall rest. And again, um, the vet that's treating should either be uh, supporting the, the uh, limbs with splints or bandages as needed. Okay, angular limb deformity. Okay, if you look here on the before, this is, this is a windswept. And you can also see not only is it windswept, which is usually this way, this one also is uh, down and back. So again, that can be one of the more difficult for um, the farm to deal with because if the horse can't hold itself up to nurse, it becomes more of a labor intensive situation. But again, it's not something that they're not gonna outgrow. It will come around, it just may be labor intensive trying to make sure that this foal is up and nursing properly if they can't get up on their own. Okay, so they can be born windswept, they can either have varus or valgus, and you know, you can have it in various, again, you can have it here, uh, hocks, and you know, also in the ankles. So you just have to make sure that you're very careful uh, with them. You're gonna have a program that you're gonna manage their exercise and support, at least for the first couple of weeks. Um, you know, if the problems persist, um, you may need to do some other types of uh, corrective measures. But again, some of those I think Mike's gonna go into. But again, it's not a death sentence. Um, we've seen many horses, I had one myself that um, I was telling somebody that was nicknamed Trainwreck because um, he just looked so horrible. And, you know, the vet would come and look and go, hmm, yeah, okay, um, what are you going to do with him? And all of a sudden, towards December of the year he was born, I look at him, I go, you know, he's not so bad looking. And not only was I able to sell him as a yearling, he had the bullet work at the Phasic two-year-old sale that he was pinhooked to and went on to win over 200,000. So again, please, all I'm saying is don't panic when you see pictures like this. Uh, they do come around. Okay, any questions? You were talking about flexor flaccidity. What sort of angle do you consider to be mild as opposed to, I'm talking about in the front limbs particularly, um, as opposed to something that's more severe? You're talking about just trying to ascertain the difference of, you know, do we wait a few weeks to see if it corrects itself with limited or um, more exercise or whether you have to get a vet to intervene? Oh. Joan, I'll kind of let Joan answer that. I mean, we, we look at it, like Seth said, you kind of just look and get an idea, but I'm sure Joan can give you some guidelines. Yeah, uh, you just want to look at them and if they're all the way down where they're going to be on their heel. You really need to get your veterinarian there to help you out, maybe put a little bandage on there. Uh, it doesn't have to be a glue-on shoe. Um, what I do, and if you're not comfortable with this, you should uh, get your blacksmith to help you. But, you know, foals are born with that little pad on their feet and can act as a rocker so their foot isn't flat. So the first thing I do is I flatten that and I see if I'm protecting that heel. And then I'll give them one or two days where I'm really monitoring uh, them on limited turnout and see if they don't come up in that fetlock. But if there's any question and they're down on that heel, you need to consult with your blacksmith and veterinarian and get them there because you don't want them, you know, damaging that. Um, most of them, uh, after you have experience with them, you can manage, but you, you want to uh, make sure you're managing them correctly and they'll come along just fine. One other thing I want to mention, um, you mentioned sepsis, sepsis, and we aren't really doing diseases in this uh, talk, but you all should be aware that it's so important that these foals get that first colostrum and you should be testing their IgG and it needs to be above 800. And if it's not, you need to make sure that it is uh, with a plasma transfusion. 
Uh, and the other thing is dipping the navel, dipping the navel, dipping the navel, because uh, if you're getting a lot of things that are going to joints, joint ills and stuff, that's the most likely entry into it. Foals that are born septicemic, you're going to have red gums, you're going to have petechial hemorrhages, you're going to have things like that. So it doesn't mean, you can do everything right and still get problems, but just two things, since, since you brought it up, I just want to say that. It's actually not a question, it's more of a comment on um, the ossification. Just being really diligent and paying attention to placentitis as well, because that can cause so many problems in the fall. So we had an acute placentitis, and the mare obviously wasn't getting the nutrients, and that caused complete cartilaginous legs. So the baby was born with no bones just because of that very acute placentitis. So making sure that you catch that and treat it in the mare can really prevent those problems. Um, earlier you talked about uh, towing out and how it usually corrects itself. Is there a point where the towing out will get in an angle where you say, now we have a problem? Yes. Um, and again, as they grow, it, it's very hard when you look at them as a newborn or a couple of weeks old, because again, they're going to be out. You know, they have narrow chests. You take a look at a, a foal that's got a chest like this versus a full grown that's like this. Um, again, it's something that you would watch and evaluate as they grow. Um, and it's, there's a, a difference between a towing out that's normal and a towing out from either the knee um, that's rotated. So you kind of have to look, is the limb itself, you know, normal, or is it a rotation from the shoulder or the knee? And I don't know if Mike or, or Seth, you have any comments on that? I think you touched it pretty well, but basically, I mean, when they're born, their whole leg will rotate out, okay? As they widen, it, it comes back around, okay? The point where you get a little worried is when you see that they're getting a little wider, um, the upper portion of the limb has seemed to turn around and they're still towing out because at that point, you're probably looking at, at, at the towing out coming from the ankle down, uh, at which point you want to get after it a little bit a little bit faster because those are the quickest growth plates to close, okay? So it comes down to, again, looking at that leg as building blocks and saying, okay, all these blocks are stacking up right or not, okay? Does that help? All right. uh, we're we're going to talk about that with regard to timing too. Yeah, I, I just want to add, in the thoroughbred, the bigger problem is towing in as their chest widens. Mm -hmm. A lot of the towing out, if it's not really severe, it comes along. And this can be, it can be in any joint. It can be coming from the knee, it can be coming from the ankle. And you really, if you have doubts, you should be looking at this once a week. And when you see those changes, you need to consult with somebody who's used to dealing with these, whether it's Seth Gregory, Mike McMahon, Lois, uh, your veterinarian. Um, but you, you want to be on top of it because uh, timely intervention with trimming, et cetera, can avoid surgery. And I always joke around that there's nothing worse than a fold that comes out perfect. Because if they come out perfect, you know things are going to go downhill. If they, they come out and they're perfect straight up and down, as they get wider, you're going to be battling, keeping them, to, stopping them from towing in. It's just the nature of the beast. I have a question about nutrition. I don't know. And, um, I was wondering what your take was on giving alfalfa to last trimester mares, foals, yearlings. How much? I tried, I personally at our farm, we try to stay away from alfalfa, at least straight alfalfa, um, just because of the calcium phosphorus issues and, you know, you have to be really careful with it. But I'm going to give Seth and Mike the chance to see if they, they do it, but I, I personally tend to stay away from it. I, again, don't feed a lot of alfalfa. Um, I do... Um, try to buy second cutting more often than first. Uh, I know you're, you're probably concerned about your mare getting enough, to, enough nutrients to support the, the last trimester. So I use uh, really high quality second cutting grass hay. Occasionally we'll have a little bit of alfalfa blended in, you know, in the field, so they do get a little bit of bump there as well. Um, I think again, it's all about moderation. You don't wanna give them anything too hot, um, but, uh, but you can. Yeah. I think you have to feed the horse like an individual, and that's what we talked about earlier. Um, excuse me, Tom. Um, I, you know, uh, if you're looking at your horse and, and she's getting alfalfa 
and she's still thin, and you're saying the baby's taking too much of her, I think you have to discuss what else could be going on. I think, I think a lot of people just want to throw feed, throw feed, throw feed without looking at what are the other causes. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, definitely don't just throw more feed. Uh, look at the whole picture. I think we're talking about the art of feeding here because I do use alfalfa in the uh, final trimester. The difference is, is that your grass haze are going to be one to one roughly in calcium to phosphorus balance. When you start throwing that alfalfa in, it's one to two. So you have to be very aware, you know, as these guys said. And, um, you know, I titrate it for certain mares, certain ways. Haven't had any problems. So that's what, it's in my hands, I think, is what we're talking about. Different people have mm -hmm. different techniques and they all work as long as you know what you're doing and it's balanced. So thank you, Lois.